Turn to See, the video magazine show about the good things happening in our community. With your host, Gary Dillard. Serving the busy Cable One audience for the past four years and now available around the world at www.hometownchannel.tv. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right. In case you can't remember to the front end of the commercial, uh, the firefighters are collecting uh, food and cash for food for gifts at Christmas or for Christmas boxes. And uh, you can drop those off at either one of the fire stations. Well, Saturday in Bisbee, we're going to be having another book signing at Atalanta's. It seems to be a, an ongoing occurrence that folks in this area just keep keep writing, keep churning out the books, and uh, uh, our guest today is from the University of Arizona. Uh, Melanie Leonard has <coughs> written uh, a book on, uh, on the environment, A Life in the Hothouse, How a Living Planet uh, Survives Climate Change. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning, Gary. Thanks for coming down. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank well, you. We, we actually tried an experiment with, uh, with, with Melanie and tried to use uh, an internet service to record her from uh, the University of Arizona, but it didn't work. We still have some bugs to work out of that technology, <laughs> so she was willing to drive down. Now she has to go back for book signings or something yeah. today, and then she'll be down Saturday. Tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow evening. Yeah, yeah for 7 o'clock tomorrow. Atalanta's. Uh, so you're going to do a reading? Are you going to do... Uh, I'll probably mostly talk. I actually really enjoy question and answer, so I'll probably talk for about 20 minutes, maybe something like that and then take questions and I find with it's a environmental topics but mainly climate change and how the earth responds to it mm -hmm. so I find that people have a lot of good questions about that it's usually pretty interesting <laughs> in exchange. okay I'll ask you a question then. okay great all right climate change tends to uh, carbon dioxide tends to be one of the culprits mm -hmm. carbon dioxide is the fuel for plants when plants take in a lot of carbon dioxide, they give off oxygen in, in trade for that. So if the planet warms, don't we have more plants? Yes, actually. I'm very good question because that is uh, one of the things I'm trying to bring forth in this book is that we need to count on the plants. We need to let them expand, and I kind of focus on forests and wetlands in particular. But... Um, in many places. I mean, let's, one problem is in the desert here where we are, we're in kind of a delicate area. Mm -hmm. So a little bit extra heat, if we don't get enough rainfall to kind of counteract that extra heat, we could be in trouble. But overall, uh, the, with more carbon dioxide in the air, plants can actually grow. Their optimum temperature goes up for growth. Mm -hmm. And basically it also helps them retain water. So they don't have to use as much water because they're um, the same place that carbon dioxide comes in is where water goes out. So they, if okay. there's more in the air, they don't have to keep the stomata open as much. Okay. So uh, when, you, when you give it a subtitle like How a Living Planet Survives Climate Change, that's sort of what you're talking about. Exactly. Uh, it, it, just like we as people change through life or change, you know, we develop defenses. If we move to a colder climate or a warmer climate, our bodies literally change. Right. And so you're saying the planet does the same thing. When it can. Now, when in can. past evolution, and I talk about hothouses when there were... Um, where there was no ice on the planet. And mm -hmm. basically, forests and wetlands expanded. Uh, not something we'd want to do now that we have cities everywhere because one of the things in the uh, last the major the hothouse, it does and we even had a major inland sea crossing mm -hmm. a lot of the west so you know we're that is definitely something we want to avoid but I think the lesson is the plants can deal with it if they're allowed to you know I mean what we have now is society not only cities on the coast and mm -hmm. in places that could flood but also um, cities blocking where forests might need to move. I mean, we are continually destroying wetlands mm -hmm. to build more developments. Right. That's starting to change. At least there's been a recognition since about the 90s that we do need wetlands. And I think after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, people really began to understand the value of wetlands there. Because one of the things they do is kind of block hurricane winds. Right. They help with that. So, you know, they're, they're coming back, but I've, it, right now we have so many different impacts that 
people are doing mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we certainly can't take what the Earth's going to do for granted, but I think what we can do is learn from it and say, oh, okay, if this is what the planet needs to do, how can we help? Okay. Shifting gears just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, there's still debate about what's happening with the, with the overall climate. Um, but for those who's, who believe that the climate uh, is warming up, how do you know whether it's a natural phenomenon, as has happened many, many times in the past, or if it's man-made? Another good question. I think that the source of the warming is what we can go back to, because basically the warmings that we've had in the past have all been associated with higher levels of greenhouse gases, such mm -hmm. as carbon dioxide. Right. And, you know, we had higher carbon dioxide then, higher temperatures. During the ice ages, we had lower carbon dioxide, lower temperatures. There are other factors too, but those things seem to be key, particularly when it comes to the ice being stable or melted. Right. So, you know, this time around, uh, so in the past, it, like 100 million years ago, it was volcanoes emitting the carbon dioxide. 55 million years ago, it looks like it was a, a major burst of methane mm -hmm. uh, from underwater that kind of contributed to a major spike there. Now it's us taking those fossil fuels out. And, and it's we, always the same. As effect. we look at the most recent ice age, however, which mm -hmm. is only a few thousand years in our past, right. uh, what brought us out of that ice age? What created, what generated carbon that would do that? That is, uh, those are called the Milankovitch cycles. It's basically how, where our Earth is in relation to the sun. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the shape of the orbit, mm -hmm. where we end up, how close we end up to the sun it, during the summer, northern hemisphere summer, and the tilt of the planet. So mm -hmm. basically it all comes down to how much sunlight is getting to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, and when those Arctic summers heat up and things start melting, it seems to set this, set this whole shift in place. And actually the temperature rise in the Arctic anyway preceded the carbon dioxide rise, right. evidence indicates. But what also seems to be coming out of the records is that that carbon dioxide rise was what then went on to destabilize the ice sheets. And so in our previous warming, or stabilize them, so in our previous warming, I'm, I guess I was going back to the last warm period, the mm -hmm. interglacial, uh, we had sea levels about 20 feet higher, from just a couple degrees temperature higher than where we are now. Then that shifts and it cools off again in that icy area and um, then we get our ice age. And so, you know, we came out of it in a natural means mm -hmm. 10,000 years ago. Um, so we're out of the ice age, and those, those ice ages have been happening, you know, at various sure. times for sure. the last two million years. But, um, you know, now we're kind of putting ourselves into a place we haven't been for at least 20 million years. And the last time, you know, it was as high, that last time carbon dioxide levels were as high as they are now, was about then and things, you know, there was a lot more ice melting. So it may take time, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. fortunately for us. But once it starts, so we're not sure if we can reverse it. So that's part of the concern. Okay. Melanie, you are an adjunct professor in the soil, water, and environmental uh, sciences department at the U of A. That's right. How long have you been doing that? Uh, well, I've been at the U of A. I actually came here for my graduate degree to study climate your, your change, PhD. my PhD, mm -hmm. in 96, in and then in 2003 I took a postdoc with the climate assessment for the southwest there, and then I kind of gradually was teaching and writing, and I've been teaching a course with um, soil, water, and environmental mm -hmm. science and for a, a couple of years now with them. Yeah. Your original degree was in journalism. That's right, bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you must enjoy writing. I do, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to, you know, have the information. There's there's a lot of great science out there, right. but a lot of it's in these journals that, you know, took me years to decipher, <laughs> to learn how to decipher. And so, you know, it, it's I think it's just really important for people to, to have that link in there. So mm -hmm. I really try to mix my, I was a reporter for newspapers for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and I really try to right in a way that people can understand. And not just that, but also make it interesting. Try to bring in interesting people and mm -hmm. their quotes and things and talk about, you know, some on the ground things, the kind of things they won't let you put in scientific so journals. So more in the area of a John McPhee, say, when he writes about the earth. I would aim for that, yes. Yeah. Uh, I admire his writing a lot. 
So, uh, in, in, in Life in the Hot House, are you drawing conclusions or are you just presenting? I actually do take a perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's kind of a, a unique one in that I'm taking... So, James Lovelock had the idea that the Earth is a living system, Gaia right. theory. And, but yet he has gone on to, to maintain that all the forests will disappear around the equator. They'll all be in the Arctic. And I am not sure where he got that. It seems to be from modeling efforts. Mm -hmm. But when you go back into the paleo record, the record of past climates, you know, there's no reason. I mean, there's evidence that thing, the forests and wetlands expanded during these warmer periods and it contracted during ice ages. And it was actually dry and dusty during ice ages, maybe half the rainfall on the planet. Mm -hmm. Part of that is just basic physics because warm air holds more moisture right. and our planet's surface is 70% water, so there's a lot of moisture to pick up. But, you know, then there's always the issue of where does it come down? So mm -hmm. what we're looking at is more intense drying when it's dry because of higher evaporation rates, but more intense storms when it does rain, mm -hmm. kind of like what we see with our monsoons, the intense storms when it's hot. And you see that in a lot of all over the world, really. Mm -hmm. The hotter seasons get the intense storms. So, okay. the, uh, This part of the country, the, the southwest, apparently went through a, a very dry era, mm, 12, 1300 A.D. Have you studied much on that? A little bit. The medieval warm period mm -hmm. was uh, a dry time, and that's, you know, that is some reason for concern for our particular little sliver on the planet. And mm -hmm. in fact, a lot of the areas around where the deserts are, are at risk with this warming. Um, if you look at our time back in the ice age we were talking about earlier, Wilcox, uh, what is now this dried out playa, except mm -hmm. for, you know, maybe now when right. the, the cranes are around when it's cool enough, used to be an expansive lake. You know, right. that's of course why it's so flat and smooth. So that was during the ice ages when actually this part of the world seems to have been one of the most lush parts on the planet because a lot of the north was covered with ice. I'm from Chicago and, you know, there was ice all the way down to sure. some of Chicago. Still is. Most of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> during the winter. <laughs> but, you know, it was an ice sheet. Yeah. And so we were actually doing pretty well and and like you say, during the warm periods, it's a big challenge for us because those higher evaporation rates do not serve us well. We've already mm -hmm. got Phoenix, for instance, has evaporation rates 10 times higher than its precipitation rates. So, you know, we clearly don't have much to spare. So we're in a fragile area, and mm -hmm. that's another reason we should be concerned. But, you know, it's another reason I like to say in cities, we really need to promote trees, tree growth, because... For one thing, we've got the pavements that can collect water and shunt it over right, to the trees. Right. So you've got kind of an artificial situation right there. And it just does such a difference for the heat. I mean, I think everybody knows stepping in the shade in the summer makes a big difference. And yeah, it takes it from 180 down to 120 <laughs> if you're in Phoenix. Yeah, literally 140 on, say, the asphalt yes. temperature down yeah. to 104. So it's yeah. a big improvement. It <laughs> is. It doesn't seem like it, but, but, it, but it certainly is. Melanie, you spent about a year after all your data was put together writing this book. That's right. That was just the writing part and then later came the peer reviewing and editing and mm -hmm. it was a it was a major process, but I really felt I just had to kind of focus on it. There's about nine chapters, so you know, figure a month a chapter and mm -hmm. then the review. So it's published by the U of A Press. That's right. So it has that academic <laughs> imprimatur in it. And they actually do trade books, so it is designed for, for lay people. That mm -hmm. is part of the Right. Theme, but it is published. Yeah, they did make me go through a peer review anyway. <laughs> well, certainly, certainly. So who would do you, who do you think your audience for this will be? I think anyone who's really concerned about the planet. And, mm -hmm. you know, actually I've been surprised even some people who don't, who are skeptical about climate change, find it, you know, I, I've had people tell me on some of these conservative radio shows, well, you know, I'm fiscally conservative, but we only have one Earth. So, you know, it, it's for anybody who wants to know more about what the planet does. I mean, I go through long time frames, basically focusing on the past 100 million years and also very modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, what does the planet do comparing the tropics to the Arctic, for instance, right. to see what it does during cold and hot times. So anyone who's interested, but I guess one of my main concerns is I want environmentalists to realize, environmentalists in particular, who are kind of on the ground fighting these causes to realize that the forests and wetlands do have a fighting chance if we help them out and we need them, you know, that we really need to support them. So I guess that's also part of the, the group I'm thinking of when I wrote it. 
Okay. The University of Arizona, of course, has for the last couple of decades had access to what's known as Biosphere 2. Have you done any research there? Uh, I haven't, but I've been there several times mm -hmm. over the years. I mean, I actually knew some of the people who started yes. it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it is. It's a great facility. It's been a little tricky because you've got so many, some of the problems in the past, for instance, when Columbia was running it, is you have so many different researchers right. coming in that everybody wants to try something different. But one of the interesting things that came out of Biosphere 2 was um, how the concrete actually takes up carbon dioxide. Really? Yeah, they were finding, you remember how their, their oxygen levels dropped so low at mm -hmm. one point? Well, part of that was because they had all this, all this carbon in the soil. They had a really rich soil that was releasing carbon, grabbing the oxygen atoms, and then that carbon dioxide molecule would be taken up by the concrete, so it was kind of disappearing into the concrete. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Is it true that old growth forests don't take up much CO2? No. That is, um, you know, they, that's kind of an old paradigm, the steady state. I mean, every forest you have to look at individually. Mm -hmm. But there's, I mean, old growth forests, for one thing, they store a tremendous amount of, of CO2. If you look at the Pacific forests of the north, what, Northwest, mm -hmm. some of the redwoods or the Doug fir big forests, they actually store five or six times more carbon than a tropical rainforest because it's been there for 2,000 years where rainforests are usually subject to more disturbance in between. Well, that's true, but I mean, it's storing it whether it's sitting there in California or whether it's two by fours in my house, right? But, you know, actually some night, some interesting research has found that hmm. those redwoods, for instance, just right. using them as an example, even though, okay, so it's part of that, what I would call a myth, comes from the idea that the, the tree rings are going to be really skinny on right. this huge tree. Right. But when you take the amount of wood that is put down the across the whole tree right. and the size of it, it's actually a, a really impressive amount. Then you've got your issue of if, if a branch falls down, that can be as big as a tree, a regular tree, and you know that is going to start decomposing. But mm -hmm. that's the other problem that a lot of the, the climate models and different models will act as if when a tr branch falls or a tree falls, it's instantly turned back into carbon dioxide, and that is just not the case. We don't have a big handle on how much of mm -hmm. it goes into soil, but some of it does, and soil mm -hmm. actually stores about twice as much carbon as forests themselves, the soils. So, you know, it, it takes, and it takes time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, with the tree ring lab, I worked with the laboratory tree ring research. Right. You can find wood there in some of the dry areas that it's, you know, they have wood going back to the ice age. So oh, yeah. it doesn't decay instantly, even in tropical forests. And, you know, some of it will go in the soil. So those things need to be sorted out a little more. And then I think we'll, we'll find that, that idea. Even now, people will not encourage the, the cutting down of old growth to have young, vigorous trees because they know that what's going to happen to all that wood, well, you know, some of it's going to decompose. Sure, sure. Melanie, ruling out changes in burning fossil fuels because that is going to be a very, very slow process because we still need energy, et cetera, et cetera. What is the single uh, most beneficial thing to slow down the hothouse that we could do as a society? As a society as a whole, I don't know how you're going to get away from slowing down fossil fuel use. You're going to, we're going to have to find a way to do that. So you're thinking but also that planting trees would be the planting trees. Yeah, okay. that that would be a great. You know, we really need both of those because we've been still destroying forests in a mm -hmm. lot of places instead of planting them. So it's kind of a double whammy. Right now, forests in the ocean are taking up more than half of the fossil fuel emissions we're putting in the air mm -hmm. from driving, lighting, heating our homes. But you know, that's we we need more of that. But we're just not going to be able. We're, yeah, I, I just have hope that there's going to be a major breakthrough on a solar mm -hmm. solar um, photovoltaic system because, you know, we can have these, these rapid changes, and we really need one. So if anybody out there is researching solar power, keep, keep going. <laughs> uh, how about uh, processes like uh, carbon sequestration? Do you see any hope for that? Oh, yeah. That, oh, are you talking about putting it, like injecting it into the ground? Mm -hmm. uh, Personally, I would. I think we should tend to mimic what the earth does, you know, and bring it down through the plants and into the soil. But I understand that we're in a situation that is a little bit more dire. Maybe we mm -hmm. trying to rush things, pull it out of the air. You know, it takes a lot of energy to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. 
but we definitely need to be cleaning our coal plants mm -hmm. to, to get the carbon out of the coal. I just wonder if there's not something else instead of injecting it, which is a bit risky. You know, we don't really know what could happen, whether that'll destabilize uh, underground or whether it'll escape somewhere else. But, you know, I think we should be thinking of what else could we do with that? Could we somehow form it back into graphite? I don't know. That's probably expensive, but... If someone has a home garden, how much carbon is that taking out of the air? Is it significant, or is a tree doing better? Probably a tree is doing better because the wood is half carbon when it's dry. Okay. But even still, you know, for the amount of emissions that an average American mm -hmm. might put out, you might need like 75 trees to take off. But, you know, once you've got those trees planted and set aside, they'll keep taking up your carbon dioxide year after year okay. unless they burn or something. So, but a garden, you know, is really, it's a drop in the bucket, but... You might actually get more savings by, if you're growing your own food, from not having your food shipped across the country. You know, okay. There's a big savings right there. So, you know, there's a lot of little So elements. as individuals, there are some things we can do to reduce the carbon footprint as well. Definitely. And, and one of the things individuals can do besides driving less and mm -hmm. using less electricity is actually eating less meat because methane production, methane is actually an even more powerful greenhouse gas mm -hmm. than carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and it eventually turns into carbon dioxide anyway. But it's, uh, you know, agriculture, cattle ranching is a big way that that's produced. So, you know, even if you just try to eat a little less meat, all these things add up. I think we need to recognize that what we do as individuals does add up. And I suppose that the fact is a lot of meat is now coming from, say, Brazil, where the topsoil is thin, so they have to grow grain in areas that last year were forest. And just taking down the forest, fresh, you know, right. taking down more forest. Although Brazil has actually been doing pretty good lately, stabilizing. I was very disappointed because I'm a vegetarian to find out that, um, you know, soy, they're growing a lot of soy in mm -hmm. Brazil in mm -hmm. not so great ways that can be destructive. So here I'm thinking, oh, eating tofu is good. And, you know, I have to, now I have to start really watching. Where is that coming from? <laughs> Melanie, uh, you're going to be at Atlanta Saturday night at 7 o'clock. That's right. And you'll be talking about your book. You'll be answering questions. Mm -hmm. um, if people want to come beat up on you or <laughs> yep. whatever, you, you're there for that. Questions. I'm sure you get a lot of that, don't you? I mean, you get a lot of because your topic is controversial. It is. And so there's going to be people that are really going to question, from probably from both sides. You're too middle of the road. You're too far left. You're too far right, whatever. Yeah, I, I'm, and I'm fine with that. I mean, I actually, I, I actually find most questions are pretty interesting and intelligent and not, you know, uh, just off the wall. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out mm -hmm. there. But, um, and, I, you know, when I give talks and stuff for the university, I sometimes get tougher questions than the people who oh, come sure. from my book, to be honest. Sure. But, uh, you know, it, it, they all deserve answers, and I'm just happy to talk with people. I, I really actually like seeing where people are because we've had some major changes in the past few years where mm -hmm. it went from, I don't know if I believe in climate change, tell me more why I should believe this, to, all right, I believe in it, what should I do about it? And now we're back to kind of the skepticism. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you well, know, the it'll take the, a while. The fact of the matter is when your economy's down, it's difficult to use energy, say, that's uh, subsidized tremendously like uh, solar and wind. Or Without is, subsidies themselves. I mean, the thing is our oil and fossil fuels are so subsidized that it's hard for renewables to compete. Yeah. Oil certainly is. I don't know about uh, others as much because, you know, all of the military contributes to the subsidy of oil. Um, yeah, the, the sh when the um, ship that, that uh, was doing the drilling out in the Gulf for the uh, the oil spill mm -hmm. recently, it was, I think it, the subsidy was like 200000 a day they were actually getting yeah. to actually be doing that drilling. It's amazing. It's a strange world we live in, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it was fun to be able to talk to you a little bit about how uh, the earth is alive and that how it will respond one way or the other to whatever we do, whatever we throw at it, it's going to respond. Yeah, and that can work for or against us. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot, of, I mean, some of the responses I talk about in the book include hurricanes and more powerful storms. So, you know, I kind of would suggest that the more we can get the forests and wetlands helping us out, maybe the less we'll have to count on some of those more dramatic disturbances that the earth can throw at us, too. <laughs> We've been talking with Melanie Leonard, an adjunct professor in the Soil, Water, and Environmental Sciences Department at the University of Arizona. 
Uh, you can meet her Saturday night at 7 o'clock at Atalanta's and ask her questions, get her to sign her book. What's it retailing for? Uh, $22.95. Oh, that's pretty cheap. Yeah, it's a paperback printed on recycled paper. Uh, of course it is. <laughs> it better be. And, of course, Joni discounts uh, all, of, all of that stuff that oh, comes great. through her store. And so you can get the author's uh, autograph. And who knows, when you get to your fourth and fifth book, those first ones will be worth a lot. <laughs> thank Melanie, you, thank Gary. you very much for, for taking the time to come down. And good luck with... Uh, with selling the book. It's been out since April, mm -hmm. so you probably have a good idea of what sales are. Yeah. And it's getting there. It's getting there. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. And I'm Thank just you here now. to talk. Thank you for watching Focus on Bisbee. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Pro Office Equipment, for sponsoring our set furniture, and Roadrunner Floors for furnishing some of our plants and other decor. Focus on Bisbee is sponsored by Copper Queen Community Hospital. Join us next Friday and Saturday morning at 8 a.m. See you then.